Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 12th, 2013. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Toxicology, Part 2. Paul the Toxicologist joins us to follow up on your concerns about possible toxic substances in homebrew. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcast and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can find me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. I'm on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We have a show page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on Google Plus, too. And thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site, especially during this busy, busy holiday season. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and go to our website, basicbrewing.com. Find our Amazon link. Click on that. It'll take you to Amazon. You'll shop just like you always do. You won't notice any difference. No in- increased pricing at all. Uh, but the only difference is that you're helping to support this show. We greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well that work in the same way. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com, or the BlackBerry podcast directory, we're on the Stitcher app, we're on the Windows phone directory. Uh, check out our Brewer's Logbook. Lots of you are. They're going out the door. I have had to order some more, so uh, fresh ones are coming in. Uh, you can find those at basicbrewingshop.com. In the front of the book is a calendar that you can use to track your fermentations and plan your brews, and there is a room in the back to log the details of up to 50 batches of brew. Tell Santa you want one under the tree. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. Thanks to everybody who has done so already. Steve and I are, are planning a special surprise uh, for those who who have contributed over the past year. So you might want to get in on that. Protect your precious beer with one of our growler bags. Check those out at basicbrewingshop.com. Speaking of Steve, Steve and I shot an episode of Basic Brewing Video this week, and I hope to get that out by Friday. In this episode, we taste a Frankenbraggot that Steve bottled. It's the uh, one that we blended on this show. Uh, also, Steve makes a milk stout creme brulee that has no beer in it, but you'd, you'd swear it did. Very tasty and very easy to make. We'll walk you through how to do that. Also, Steve and I will be getting together next Tuesday to record our end-of-the-year barley wine show and to read your brewing disaster stories. So get your brewing disaster stories to me by Monday to be on the show. Monday, 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 we'll be giving away fabulous prizes as we do every year. Uh, I want to get right into the interview. Uh, We're not using Paul's last name because he doesn't want his employer to have any concerns about his appearance on the show. Uh, This is the second show on the topic, and if you haven't heard the first, you'll want to go into the archives and find it. A lot of good information there. And uh, Paul and I covered quite a bit of ground today. And part of what I found fascinating about the discussion is, is that Paul not only talks about the individual concerns, but he lets us in on the process that he and other toxicologists follow to reach the conclusions that they do. Uh, So it really gives you a sense of confidence that maybe they know what they're doing. Uh, Also, if you are a dog owner and or dog lover, you want to be sure to listen to all the way to the end of the interview. Toxicologist Paul, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thanks for having me back, James. You know, last last time we got together, um, you know, it's one of those shows where is pretty. There's a lot of solid information there, and kind of cut and dry. And it's one of those things like uh, the uh, sanitization shows that I did way back with uh, Charlie Talley of Star San and uh, 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 Merle Landman of uh, uh, with the uh, Iota Four. You know, those were those were shows that I thought that you know we need to do these things because this is good information. You know, not everybody's going to like it, but you know we'll do it anyway. And so those shows I got a lot of response from, uh, a lot more than than I anticipated. And this one is another one where it's like, you know, this is pretty cut and dry information. 
Um, you know, it might lose some people because we're getting pretty technical. But, I mean, we got a whole bunch of, uh, of good responses from people, and I forwarded them all to you. <laughs> yep. it, we got a lot of responses and, you know, a lot of good questions. A lot of a lot of people who I think thought a lot about what we were talking about and, and had some a lot of good ideas. So it, it's nice to be able to get back together and try to address some of the questions that clearly we should have addressed in the last episode. But uh, but missed for one reason or another. Well, we, we last episode was jam packed. So uh, uh, we it, it's no wonder that we couldn't get to uh, get to everything. But let's let's get right to it. Um, one of the most popular uh, questions was about brewing a bag and about the the, the nylon bag that people use to brew with. And uh, specifically, I guess, the the painters or the paint straining bags that you can get at the hardware store and whether using those can can uh, provide some sort of a, a toxicity danger. So what did you find out about, about those bags and about brewing a bag bags in general? You know, I think this was another example where I'm going to suggest that you look for a food grade bag uh, just because if you really want to reduce your risk of anything, it's always best to look for something that is food grade. And, you know, talking, exchanging emails with a couple of the people who had listened to the show, some of them were able to say that, yeah, when they looked at their bag, it had come from the homebrew store and it had said food grade. Um, but I think we wanted to look a little bit more into what what is the difference between food grade and not food grade. And uh, surprisingly, we in, ended up exchanging an email with someone, uh, one of your listeners, Brian, who works in the polymer industry and actually knew a lot about nylon and what makes up nylon and what kind of things could possibly be there. And so it was really interesting to exchange emails with one of your other listeners to get some information that, again, I'm not a polymer chemist, so I, I really don't know any of that information. So should we be worried? No, I, you know, I don't think so. I think try to use a food grade bag, but if you don't, I think this is another example where most of these bags are probably not something you have to worry about. Uh, the email from Brian, he talked about uh, the nylon that is used in those paint straining bags is probably either, he said, nylon 6 or nylon 66. And he actually went further and said it's probably nylon 66. And he said looking at how they manufacture nylon 66, there's really not a lot of things in that production process that would be carried over into a final product that would have any concern. Um, so he said that nylon 66 is not made with solvents. It's not made with a, any metal catalysts. So really, and the only thing that could possibly be left there would be unreacted monomers. And I looked at the unreacted monomers that could possibly be there and it could be one of two things. It could be a dipic acid, and it could be hexamine diamine. When I looked at the toxicity of both of those compounds, they're really pretty much non-toxic compounds. And looking at those two things, if they were to leach into your wart during the brewing the bag process, uh, you'd really have to get exposed to a lot of those compounds before you'd have to worry about them. Um, I think one of the other mitigations that you could take if you were concerned about using a, a nylon paint strainer bag is you could do a pre-extraction. So again, there's only going to be a limited number of these monomers there. So if you wanted to, you could take your paint strainer bag and dunk it in boiling water or really, really hot water. Uh, let it extract out any of those unreacted monomers. If you did that once, or if you're really concerned, maybe two or three times, there would be uh, very little, if not no, monomers left over. So I think if you are really worried, buy a food-grade bag. If you're a little bit less worried, do that extraction protocol. But really, you're probably talking about, uh, even though it's not necessarily food-grade, it's probably not something, as long as you're using a white bag, or, um, you know, like a clear nylon, it's probably not much to be worried about. There is a, a close cousin to Bruna Bag. Uh, at least they, they were born in the same neighborhood. And that is uh, no-chill brewing with the plastic. They call them jerry cans. Uh, but the plastic containers where uh, the, the theory is that you take hot wort and you don't chill it at all. And you put it into these containers, these plastic containers, 
seal them up and let the wort chill on its own, and then you can use it uh, either the next day or some are using uh, their wort, uh, you know, weeks or, or months after brewing. Um, so I guess the area that we probably want to look at there is, again, the use of plastics and uh, especially the use of plastics in heat and then the pl- use of these plastics and the long-term storage of this food product uh, in these containers. So I think this example is really similar to the example we had with the picnic cooler mash tuns. Uh, when I emailed the manufacturer of the picnic coolers, they said that they really didn't intend the picnic coolers to be used in that way. So they really didn't have any data to say one way or another uh, what was getting leached out. But really what's probably, if since those picnic coolers are rated for the storage of liquids over a long period of time, and really the things that they use in the production of those plastics, if anything's going to leach out, they're going to leach out really quick into water, probably at room temperature water almost as well, if not as well, as in hot water. So I think you have a very similar situation with these jerry cans. Again, I'm, I'm going to preach, please look and look and try to find a food-grade jerry can. And when I looked, uh, the ones that people were using are most likely food-grade jerry cans that are being marketed for the use of long-term water storage. Uh, the, actually, I did an internet search, and the ones that I found coming from a company here in the United States specifically said that they're compliant with the uh, United States regulations for food contact. So really, these things are meant to be used in contact with water and even storage of water long-term. Anything that you're using, uh, and actually the example that we got from your listener was that he was using jerry cans that had been used to store malt extract mm. for months. So anything that would be storing malt extract for months, uh, anything that would be in that plastic would be already be migrating into that wort uh, malt extract. So I really wouldn't worry too much about pouring uh, even hot liquid into these jerry cans and letting them sit for extended periods of time. I think anything that was in that plastic will migrate out almost immediately. It's food grade, so whatever's migrating out, these companies already know it's it's non-toxic. So that doesn't address the issue of possible uh, contamination, uh, you know, by uh, food spoilage organiza- uh, organisms over that time. You're just looking at exposure to the plastic. Yeah, well, I'm just talking about the exposure to plastic. Uh, I, I'm a toxicologist. I'm certainly not a microbiologist. And I, I definitely try to stay away from giving advice on microbiology. It is a question that we did have come up from a number of listeners as well about spoilage organisms, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not quite qualified to, or not even nearly anywhere near qualified to answer questions about spoilage organisms. <laughs> now, that's a question that I have as well, so uh, maybe that's it. We will have to dig up another expert. Uh, uh, if you if, if you out there are a, uh, an expert in uh, food spoilage uh, organisms uh, and want to uh, give us a chat, uh, drop me a line. Uh, There's got to be one of them out there, James. Surely. Uh Anything else to say about jerry cans? I mean, I guess the point is that if if it's safe for for long term storage at room temperature, it, it's safe for hot f- fluids. I would say, you know, in the vast majority of cases, the answer is probably yes. I think it there, because anything that would migrate out of that plastic into your wort or into your beer, uh, it's going to come out in drinking water as well. And they run tests on these plastics to make sure that anything that would leach out into drinking water would not be of concern. So I think what you're even if you're putting in very, very hot water, unless you're really getting melting of the material, which most of these cases, if you know if they were melting, certainly. Um, but unless it's melting, you're not getting anything in there that wouldn't migrate into room temperature water. So it's safe to drink a Bob Stemsky's beer. I would say Bob has nothing to worry about. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> at least in, in, in not from that, at least yeah, at least with the bags and the and the jerry cans, uh, we shouldn't worry. Um, uh, chlorine bleach. Uh, way back in the day, uh, that that show I was talking about earlier with Charlie Talley, he actually talked about how to make a no rinse sanitizing solution with uh, chlorine bleach and I believe. Uh, vinegar, 
Uh, you don't want to combine those together. Um, but uh, the, you go back and listen to that show. Find that show in the archives. That's way back probably in 2006 or seven. I mean, way back at the very beginning. Um, but uh, he he explains how to make a no-rinse uh, chlorine bleach uh, uh, out of – or no-rinse uh, chlor- no uh, sanitizing solution out of chlorine bleach. So it, so it can be done. So what do we got to look out for with the chlorine bleach? Well, and I don't want to keep people from going back through your archives, James, but uh, John Palmer's How to Brew, which you can find an old version online, has a good recipe for the exact same solution. So – it's it's definitely a, a sanitizing solution that is well accepted. It definitely works. I think one of the things that a lot of people are going to warn people about in terms of bleach solutions is I think the big concern there is off flavors um, because there there can be off notes, especially if you make up a too strong of a solution or if you have too much residue uh, left over. Um, Actually, the other thing about chlorine is that it doesn't react well with metals. So if you are using a fermenter that's stainless steel, I would probably stick away, stay away from using the bleach sanitizers as well. However, if you are using it as just a sanitizing solution, the amount uh, and using it in a proportion according to what's recommended, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Uh, the chlorine, the amount of chlorine... Actually, I did a calculation as to the amount of chlorine that you might expect to have left over on your fermenter if you were using it to sanitize your fermenter. And assuming you're using five gallons of that bleach solution prepared as directed by uh, your podcast or John Palmer's book, you'd end up with uh, an amount that is really small. You'd end up maybe consuming 1.4 milligrams per day if you're consuming two beers a day if you have a worst case leftover amount of residue of chlorine on your fermenter. Uh, the EPA has done a calculation of the worst case safe level for chlorine exposure, and that is 7 milligrams per day. So at 1.4 milligrams per day with a worst case, seriously worst case exposure scenario, you're still about fivefold under what that safe level is. Um, you know, I, I've heard about another couple things in terms of bleach. I saw in a in a Brew Your Own magazine once one of the people they had interviewed was warning people that bleach was going to cause dioxins to be con, uh, produced in their beer. And uh, I, I actually did my PhD on dioxins, and I can I can tell you that there is uh, almost zero percent chance of dioxins being produced in your beer if you have or if you're using a chlorine bleach. So. That's certainly nothing I would worry about. Uh, The other thing to worry about with bleach is uh, food grade again. So not to hammer home this point one more time, but you should be looking for a bleach that is food grade. Uh, I think it's probably pretty easy to do. Look for ones that are free of fragrances or uh, colors. Do they add colors to bleach these days? Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Other things. Make sure they're fragrance-free at least. When I uh, when I looked at the box a bottle of uh, name brand bleach that I have in my cabinet, it actually even gave instructions on the bottle of how to prepare a sanitizing solution from it. So, <laughs> if your bottle of bleach has on it instructions as to how to make up a sanitizing solution for food contact surfaces, uh, I'd be I'd feel awfully comfortable using that uh, as a sanitizing solution. And one thing that Charlie Talley said was that. Uh, he would steer people probably more toward the uh, the generic brands because they wouldn't have a lot of the additives that you might find in, in a bleach that's trying to be, you know, clothesline fresh or, you know, uh, trying trying to mask the bleachy smell uh, with with some fragrances or some some kind of scents added to it because you don't want your beer to be clothesline fresh. <laughs> uh, something about a spring saison or something springs to <laughs> that but uh yeah prob- <laughs> probably not a springtime fresh uh, uh pale ale or anything like that uh <laughs> i think that's probably pretty good advice and i think if you what you can do is you can look at that bottle of bleach and look on the back sodium hypochlorite is the active ingredient in bleach uh steer away from thing other things that are there oxyclean we had a bunch of questions or we had some questions about oxyclean uh is that i mean it's it's i guess 
if the guy that shouts at you or used to shout at you uh, on TV uh, is right, then it's good for laundry. But is it is it good for your uh, cleaning your gear? Yeah, uh, this is another. It was an interesting one to look up. Uh, it's actually another one of those things that I use in my brew house as well. Um, I think an important pipe, an important point with OxyClean is, at least I don't think it's a sanitizer. I believe that it, you know, what I use it for, and I think what other people are probably using it for is as a as a uh, cleanser. It, is that true, James? Do, are people using that as a sanitizer or is that a cleanser that people use it as? I believe that people are are using it as a as a as a substitute for PBW or you know or or some sort of a, a cleaning agent. I don't think. I mean, I could be wrong, uh, and some people may be using it as a sanitizing agent. But I think that it's that it's something to clean gear rather than sanitizing gear. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and that's exactly how I use it too. Is I use it as a substitute for PBW. So, you know, based on that, uh, it really should be rinsed off. So, OxyClean, it's a cleanser. It's not a sanitizer. I always do a thorough job of rinsing my gear once I've used it. So even if so, even if it is not truly food grade, let's just, so the compounds that are in OxyClean are. Sodium carbonate and sodium carbonate peroxide. And when I see those compounds, I think the most likely contaminants in them are probably heavy metals. Uh, those will actually they will rinse off of your plastic or glassware pretty readily. I think even if you had uh, impurities in your OxyClean of like uh, 100 part per million of any of those things, which is actually a pretty, pretty large contamination uh, of something like that, you the, even if you had 1.01% of the residue left over on your fermenters for some reason which i think is you're rinsing these things off and they're water soluble i think it's highly unlikely that anything would be left on there uh i i just don't think you're going to get any exposure to any compounds through the use of oxyclean as a cleanser um so i wouldn't worry about it now I I go the cheap route or cheaper route I guess and I use uh, dishwashing automatic dishwashing powder uh to clean my carboys. And I I don't think we talked about this last time, did we? No, I don't think so. Uh so it is I guess it's food grade because you use it in your dishwasher with your dishes uh and I you know put a scoop in the carboy with uh, hot water and swirl it around and mix it up and then fill the carboy all the way up to the top and then let it sit overnight and you know the gunk is pretty much gone by the uh, by the next day and then i use the uh, the carboy brush to make sure everything is gone and then i rinse it i rinse it you know i'm cautious so i rinse it, the carboy with hot water like 3 times to make sure all the because you know the dishwashing liquid or dishwashing powder does have a scent it does uh, have some fragrance, but I find that after rinsing like three times with hot water, that's gone, and I have a nice clean carboy um, that uh, that doesn't that doesn't smell again. Uh, you know, springtime fresh. Yeah, so, it, same. I think that's the same situation, if not a little bit better. I mean, I, it's important to consider what is the intended use of that product, and if that intended use is for food contact surfaces. I think that that's the the gold standard of what you'd want to be looking for to clean your brew house. Now we get this may be a, a big section here: naturally occurring compounds in the beer, uh, like higher alcohols and diacetyl and such as that. Uh, should we be worried if we are uh, fer fermenting poorly and uh, you know stressing out our yeast such that they put off? Uh, things that uh, cause not only off flavors, but these compounds that, uh, you know, we like diacetyl, you know, we've we've heard about it in the news, uh, you know, that they've been taking it out of uh, the movie popcorn, you know, the microwave movie popcorn and such as that because of health concerns. Uh, could we be through some fault of our own in the process, be making some naturally occurring things actually from the ingredients of the beer? Uh, no, this uh, this is an interesting question, and you know, I think the first thing that I think of is that people have been drinking beer for hundreds or thousands of years, and certainly the brewing practices today are a lot more advanced as they than they'd ever been. So the amounts of these compounds that people are seeing, probably even in homebrew, 
are probably lower than they've ever been historically. And, you know, historically, I don't, I don't think these were really a concern. I would say that for the most part, you can, you can write off naturally occurring compounds as being a, a problem in your beer. Uh, certainly things like acetaldehyde or diacetyl, um, or even some of the, the phenolic or flavoring compounds that could be produced. But I, you, it, it was an interesting exercise to go through some of these. And I, and I think it might still be uh, educational for people to kind of talk about a couple of them anyway. Sure. Okay. Uh, so one of the ones that I looked at in, in some amount of detail is diacetyl. So in you brought up microwave popcorn, and I, that's it. So it's an interesting one that's been in the news that people have definitely been associating with toxicity. And of course, you know, part of the reason I'm on this show is hopefully to help educate some people about some of the principles that we deal with with toxicology. And this is one where the way that you're exposed to the toxin has a really big impact on whether the, t- the compound is toxic or not. Diacetyl has been linked to some toxicities, but that's only through inhalation. Uh, and really through the consumption, uh, either through drinking it or eating it, there's much, much less concern. I think that the best example of this is asbestos, which if you're inhaling it's asbestos, it can lead to a very specific type of cancer, and it's, it's really nasty. But if you were to eat asbestos, you actually have almost no worry about asbestos at all. It will go right through your system. Uh, and in fact, there was, a, there was a scare a number of years ago about asbestos being embedded in crayons. So Crayola had to do some damage control about asbestos being in crayons. Mm. But the funny thing is, if you wanted to reduce the toxicity of asbestos, the best thing to do with it would be to embed it in wax so the only way you would be exposed to it would be through ingestion, and that's kind of what Crayola had on their hands. So diacetyl is in a kind of similar area where if you're inha- inhaling it, it may have more toxicity than if you're uh, drinking it or eating it. It is actually, even though there is some toxicity out there, it is an approved flavor in the United States. Uh, so the FDA has reviewed it and approved it for use as a flavoring agent. Uh, like you said, microwave popcorn, it's still an approved food additive, uh, even if people are trying to get away from it. So what I did with diacetyl is I actually did a, a, a calculation. So I talked in the previous us, um, podcast about looking at two aspects of a risk assessment, one of them being exposure and the other one being hazard. And we talked a lot about exposure assessments, calculating how much someone might be exposed to if uh, if they had this compound in beer. So for diacetyl, I used a value of 5 ppm in beer uh, based on the fact that the White Labs website, ha- which has a lot of great information about yeast strains and the off flavors they produce, they said that beer can have, homebrew can have, greater than 1 ppm of diacetyl. So I, I multiplied that number by 5 to get 5 ppm. So we uh, have concentration of 5 ppm in beer, if you're consuming 700 milliliters or about two beers per day, you'd have exposure to about 3.5 milligrams of diacetyl per day. The hazard assessment is actually something else that I did for diacetyl using uh, principles that are outlined in the ICHQ3C uh, guideline for residual solvents in pharmaceuticals. So that's kind of a mouthful, but The ICH is the International Conference on Harmonization, and they give a lot of guidance on actually a lot of things, economic and uh, free trade and all sorts of things, but surprisingly enough, also toxicological guidance. And the calculation of a safe level or ADI is something that they give guidance to in their Q3C guidance. So using the study in rats that they had published, they had a 90-day study in rats where they had no adverse effects at 90 milligrams per kilograms. So that is what we call a point of departure. So I used that 90 mg per kg in rats as a point of departure, and then I started to apply some uncertainty factors to account for inter-individual variability. So that's a factor of 10. So we're at 90 mg per kg using the rats. We're going to divide that by 10 because we don't know uh, from me or you, we may have very different response to diacetyl. So we're going to just multiple, take a factor of 10 to account for that. 
It was a 90-day study, so the ICHQ3C documents suggest we should use a factor of five to say, if you're going to be exposed chronically, let's account for that in some way. So let's multiply again by five. And really, multiplying by five is a, it's a really a pretty big factor when trying to account for uncertainty. And the last factor I took was a five for extrapolating that data from rats to humans. So all total, we're taking that number of 90 mg per kg in that rat study, and I'm going to divide it by 250 based on those uncertainty factors that I just talked about. And that gives us an ADI or a safe level of 0.36 mg per kg in humans would be highly unlikely to produce an adverse effect. So I took that 0.36, I multiplied it by a 70 kilogram adult, and that ends up with a concentration of 25.2 milligrams per day would really be a safe level and is likely to be safe for a vast majority of the population. So 25.2 mg per keg is a or 25 mg per day is a safe level. Uh, we said that if you were based on that concentration in beer that you could be exposed to 3.5 mg of diacetyl per day. So your exposure is still about sevenfold lower than what that safe level is that we calculated. Wow. So really not anything to worry about in terms of diacetyl. Now, an interesting point in the Crayola uh, asbestos question, the the only colors that you really had to worry about were uh, burnt sienna. So... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I was trying to think. Fire truck red is that yeah. a color? Too? <laughs> well, you were doing all that figure, and I was trying to figure out a uh, uh, the the most hazardous color in the box. Uh, <laughs> politically, it was the flesh color, but you may not be old enough to remember that. Uh, no, I don't remember that one. Yeah, they, there was actually when I was growing up, there was a color actually called flesh. Uh, which they later uh, changed to peach because it, it turns out not everybody has the same flesh color. Uh, now I did it, it, back on the back on the topic. Uh, I did have a question. Um, you know, when we were doing the uh, the freeze concentrated beers, the ice barley wine and the apple jack. You know, where you take uh, a beer and you freeze it and then you uh, you let it. Uh, you turn it upside down essentially, and you let the uh, uh, mostly the alcohols which melt first. Although there's going to be some water that melts as well, uh, but that you know that's a way of freeze concentrating uh, the beer to make it stronger in alcohol and stronger in flavor. Uh, and a lot of people, or, or not a lot, a handful of, of people uh, question that the safety of that, saying that that's going to concentrate the bad stuff in the beer, including the higher alcohols, which not only give you a headache and hangover, uh, they're also toxic to your system and you're, you're actually going to do damage to yourself. Uh, so even with that, you know, concentrate, and it's hard to, and it's hard to figure out how much you're concentrating, uh, because in addition to the, the alcohols that are coming out, you're, like I say, you're also get, getting some of the water ice that's melting as well at room temperature. Um, so that, that may be a curveball to throw you, but should we be worried about ice? Oh, and there's also a thing where the TTP guy, the TTB guy that I corresponded with, says that it's perfectly legal for home brewers to do it. And now I'm getting uh, somebody else emailed another TTB person who says it's not legal for you to do it. So my my advice is not to email the dead gum TTB. <laughs> 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 Just do it at home. Don't sell it. Don't worry about it. But <laughs> yeah, similar to your uh, propane questions to the propane safety guy. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so should we worry about uh, theoretically freeze concentrating our our beers? You know, so I, I'm not in. I'm not so. I didn't do too much research on the higher alcohol, so I, I guess I don't know exactly how to proceed with those. I think. For something like diacetyl, you're right. There's a lot of lot of factors there. So it, when you freeze it, I don't know if you're freezing diacetyl or if the diacetyl is concentrating. Although I, I would argue that you're probably not going to be drinking two of these uh, ice box every night for the rest of your life. So again, we're with the uncertainty factors that we have factored in plus chronic exposure. I think things like diacetyl and those flavor compounds are probably not a big deal. You know, I think. An interesting point is, you know, you said that they are the kinds of compounds that cause hangovers and uh, headaches. Well, 
I would say that hangovers or hangovers and headaches, that's acute toxicity. I mean, that mm. is, that's what you're feeling there. So if, if you freeze concentrate a beer and you're getting all hangovers and headaches every time you drink, maybe even a little bit, I, that's toxicity. So I, I would definitely be careful about it. Now, if you, you need to drink five of them to get the hangover and, and headache, uh, maybe, maybe that's not that big of a concern, but, uh, you know, use some cues from what you're feeling when you drink the beer. I mean, there, there really is toxicity. Well, and and that goes back to her point is that the the alcohol uh, that we're 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 trying to uh, to create or, or have created by the yeast because we we're not doing any work uh, the, <laughs> the yeast is doing it uh, but the stuff that we are we are trying to make is toxic to us uh, in in higher amounts uh, so that I mean that just reinforces that point but I guess my point in responding to those people who are worried about the uh, you know the freeze concentrated uh, apple jack and the ice barley wine. Uh, you know I'm not going to drink a pint of that. Um, you know I'm going to drink a moderate amount of that uh, in a in a little bit of a snifter because it is it's it is strong and and it's not designed to be you know a, a, a lawnmower beer that you chug a couple you know uh, on a hot uh, afternoon. So anyway, I, I, I guess moderation, uh, which is what we stressed in the first one, moderation is the key. Yeah, totally agree, James. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but we digress. But uh, <laughs> I'll step you know, off my my soapbox now. Uh, certainly, uh, diacetyl is not the only thing that people find in beer. And you know, I I think one of the, some of the interesting other compounds that I looked at were some of the those flavor compounds that are generated when you uh, use some of these funny yeasts, so esters or clo. Uh, Esters like banana or clove that come in from either uh, a half yeast or one of the the Belgian yeasts. So I, I looked at those just as you know another kind of fun exercise. And so isoamyl acetate, which is the ban- banana ester, you know it is an, also an improved flavoring compound according to the FDA. And the concentration in beer, uh, the actually the concentrations in beer, it says it can be up to about seven ppm. Uh, surprisingly enough, it is actually in bananas as well at huh. 25 ppm. Huh. <laughs> so the banana ester uh, that you find in beer is actually also naturally occurring in bananas, at even a higher level in bananas. So I, there's really not much toxicity data on these compounds, uh, hardly any at all. But really, they're naturally occurring in bananas. You're, you're not worried about overdosing on bananas. Uh, well, at least I'm not over, worried about overdosing on bananas, but uh, I, I wouldn't worry about things like the, the banana ester. And something very similar with the, the clove ester, which is uh, also found in things like grains and fruits and vegetables. So, so relax, so, don't worry, have a banana. <laughs> <laughs> So we got some. We got some kind of uh, some of the the um, uh, questions were kind of off the wall, or I hadn't hadn't heard of them before. Someone wrote in saying, um, "Is it safer to use?" Uh, someone wrote in saying that they had heard that it wasn't as safe to use hot tap water as it was to use cold tap water and heat it up for for human consumption. Can you explain that? Yeah, you know, this is one where I saw it. The first thing I thought was, oh, I've heard this urban legend before. So this is, you know, there's clearly nothing to this. Um, But, you know, I did a quick Google search on it, and I found a a good website from both the CDC and the EPA where they give advice that if you're in a certain region and if your lead is high in your your plumbing, that you should avoid using hot water out of the tap for things like um, preparing food or making tea or coffee. Hmm. So there may actually be something to this one. Uh, I think the important thing to note and the important thing that was noted uh, by the CDC and the EPA was this is really only a problem if your plumbing has high amounts of lead. And so if your pipes do not have high amounts of lead, and I would assume that if you're living in relatively new developments, uh, a housing development, I know I live in a relatively new housing development. I don't really think that I'm going to be uh, in scope for this. 
But if you live in a house that's 120 years old, uh, it could be that you do have uh, some lead piping running through your house. It may be something that before you get too far that you may want to look into. Um, I I do remember responding to that uh, listener and saying, but more or less it's the exact same thing that, you know, it it's something that you should be aware of. And if you want to reduce your lead concentration, that you should at least do the diligence of trying to figure out whether your, your plumbing has high lead concentrations or not. I, I would guess that there are websites you could look at, municipal websites that may give information about lead content. Uh, I even looked online and there's even home test kits for lead concentrations in water. I'm not sure uh, how accurate those test kits are. Uh, maybe one of your listeners will be able to uh, email in after this and let us know uh, whether those home test kits for lead would be accurate or not. Uh, but I, I think if you really were concerned about the lead coming out of your pipes and you were lived in a, an older home, I would... I would consider running that test in just to confirm um, that there is a lead problem. And if there's not a lead problem, then I'd, I'd say go for it. Use the the power of your water heater to help give you a, a head start on on heating your wort or your mash water. Um, and the ex- only experimental design I would say is take a sample of cold water out of the tap and then take a sample of hot water out of the tap. Have both of them analyzed. If, if there's lead in... The cold one, you know, that's that's something, but it's only a problem if it's higher in the hot one. So if they're both the same, then there's no there's no harm in using the hotter water. And that one came from uh, Leif in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, I believe. Yeah, that's right. He said he was living in a in a newer development, so hopefully he's he doesn't have that problem, and he can use his really hot tap water to uh, use as mash water. Yeah, over the, in in some parts of the world they get they get free hot water, don't they? Yeah, I think th- uh, that that is what he said, wasn't it? Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um Star San and hardware store buckets. Uh so Star San is uh, acidic, right? Uh to to a certain extent and, and if you if you some people leave uh, some people store mix up some Star San and and store it uh, for use later on, is uh, is the star sand going to leach some stuff out of your uh, your buckets, your plastic buckets? Yeah, and I think this probably uh, builds off of the advice that we gave last time that if if you're going to use those plastic buckets that you get from the hardware store, that you know those really aren't food grade, and you should probably stick stay away from using them for long term storage, uh, like you would get during fermentation of your beer. So I, I'm going to stick to that advice and say if you're going to ferment in those buckets that you should probably use a food-grade bucket, look for a white one, uh, look for either the homebrew bucket or something that you get from uh, food service, You know, look, look for a bakery bucket, something like that. I think the difference between using that bucket for fermentation and using it to store that star sand is that for fermentation – you're going to end up with migration of those compounds from the bucket directly into the fluid you're consuming. If you're storing star sand in it, you're really not you're not consuming the star sand. You may, you're going to then rinse this not rinse the star sand off, but you're going to let it drip off. Uh, and really, there's not going to be that much left from whatever would leach out of the bucket into the star sand, and then be left over on any equipment you might be sanitizing. Uh, you know, I think when I looked at this. I, I use another principle that we use uh, every now and again in toxicology, and it's it's this principle of the to- threshold of toxicological concern, uh, or TTC. And the concept behind this is people have looked at large data sets, hundreds and hundreds of compounds that are known to be toxic, and they've developed these limits for compounds where no matter, even if you don't have any data, you can make an assumption that consumption of a certain amount of compounds is never going to have any harm to you. So even for the most severely toxic compounds, if you're consuming less than 0.15 micrograms per day of that compound, even if it's a carcinogen, your body has the ability, it's a wonderful machine that has the ability to eliminate toxins. So if you're consuming that very minuscule small amount, 
you really don't have to worry about it because the data says that you are not going to have any toxicity from it. Hmm. And that's only for the most highly toxic compounds. If you're talking about things that are not genotoxic, meaning they're not going to cause cancer, then you can go all the way up to 540 micrograms per day of these compounds, like a, I'm going to say a, a regular toxin. So whatever a regular toxin is, you can, you can really go up to one, uh, 540 micrograms per day or even 1.8 milligrams per day of some compounds, depending on the chemical structure, and really be confident that you'd have no toxicity. So I kind of took this concept of TTC, of the threshold of toxicological concern, and, and tried to apply it to this sanitizing solution in a bucket. And I made this assumption that let's say you have uh, something in that bucket that's going to migrate into the star sand. And let's assume that one ten thousandth of the compound in the sanitizing solution is going to end up on the combination of everything that you sanitize in there. And I think one ten thousandth is actually a, probably a, an overestimate. To put it in perspective, if you have five gallons or 20 liters of sanitizing solution, one one thousandth of it would be 20, 20 milliliters. And that's about a half a fluid, fluid ounce, which is so like a shot glass. So half of a shot glass. So one ten thousandth would be a tenth of half of a shot glass, which mm. if you talk about sanitizing solution, even with the bubbles, you're talking about a really thin film and you're probably not talking about very much solution. So even so, if you assume that you're having that much carryover onto the things that you're sanitizing, you'd need 40 milligrams of genotoxic compounds to be in that plastic bucket and migrating into your star sand to worry to end up with a concentration above that threshold of toxicological concern of 0.15 micrograms per day. So that's of the most toxic compounds, and most of those. Uh, they're probably not going to survive the manufacturing process. These things are very reactive in an aqueous environment. They're probably going to react and turn into other things. So really, I think that the odds of that happening are, are very slim. And then if you're talking about the quote unquote regular toxins, you'd need your bucket to contain 150 grams of them or even 500 grams of those compounds. And there's just, there's just not any way that that much is going to migrate into your star sand. So now, for that application, I really, just, I, I really wouldn't worry about it. So one thing that, 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 uh, and we're, we may be burying the lead here, uh, but one thing I want to, want to get to before we run out of time is, uh, the concern about, uh, not toxicity to us, but to, uh, one of our, furry friends and that is uh, we got an email saying asking about uh, that or warning us about the toxicity of of hops uh, to dogs and apparently apparently that's a real thing and i think we've talked about it before on the show uh, but apparently people who have uh, had their dogs eat hops either spent or fresh um, in in it i guess it depends on the breed um they can have some really serious and possibly deadly results. Yeah, it's yeah, that's true. And I, I looked it up in uh, actually Northern Brewer has a really good uh, article on their website about exactly this, that you should make sure they keep your your furry friends away from your 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 brood supply or your uh, your spent grains, especially if, they, if not your spent grains, the spent grains are OK, but. Spent grains with hops, you really want to make sure that your dogs stay out of those. Um, keep them away from your binds as well. Uh, you know, I looked at the, the data that's out there. The mechanism of why the hops are toxic to dogs is not fully understood, uh, but they think that it may have something to do with the uncoupling of oxidative phosphorylation, uh, which is the process through which your mitochondria are making ATP. And the uncoupling is where they stop making ATP and instead they start generating heat. So the way that it leads to toxicity in the dogs is by uh, hyperthermia. So the, the body overheating and and yeah, it, it's definitely something that people should be should be aware of. Yeah, I was reading the comments uh, underneath that article, and some of them were just heartbreaking from dogs that uh, and apparently some some dogs can eat hops and be okay, and others. I mean, just a little bit can be deadly, and these dogs, 
you know, their temperature ramps way up and, and they overheat and they and they die. I mean, it, it burns them up. Uh, so apparently yeah. one of the one of the treatments is to get the dog into ice water as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, another one said uh, that the, the emergency vet was uh, administering IVs. And and so, uh, you know, getting getting treatment as quickly as possible is apparently the key. Uh, but just a horrible, be a horrible, horrible thing. Um, you know, I know that we're extremely attached to our dogs. Uh, so, you know, I don't even give my dogs beer uh, as samples, you know, not even little little drips of beer, uh, you know, after hearing about this years ago. Uh, so anyway, if you've got dogs, keep them away from your compost heap. If you put the hops in the compost heap, keep them away from your Brewing supplies, if you get a, you know, a brewing kit in the mail, keep them, you know, just keep them away from hops. Yep, definitely. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, I want to want to talk about uh, our friend Scott Kuwe, who has been on the show talking about roasting coffee. Uh, had some kind of backup information backing up our our uh, assertion that aluminum pots were okay. Yeah, this was another nice uh, exchange that we had with another one of the listeners. Uh, it, it's great to have a, a whole audience out there that can fill in some of these details, whether it's about uh, polymers or whether it's about aluminum. Uh, he gave us some more information about that aluminum pot, and he had really good information on the fact that really we don't have to worry about using aluminum pots. And it, it definitely made me feel a lot more comfortable with saying that in the last podcast. So he said that aluminum oxidizes almost instantly on contact with oxygen. Uh, and really, when you're looking at the gray that you have in your pot from boiling water, uh, it's really a really deep oxide layer that actually they call sapphire. Uh, it's very non-reactive, and it really, you're not going to have any leaching of aluminum into your beer unless you get a scratch. And really, even if you have a scratch, because of this uh, process where you're getting this sapphire forming, A, you're not going to get much aluminum leaching out, and it's going to return to that sapphire state um, very quickly. So it, it's definitely good to hear that even our worst-case estimates are still probably much worse than they really are. Um, so don't worry about your aluminum pots. And is it West Virginia that's the sapphire state? or is, Oh, no, wait, that's the thing I <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> I can't help it. Well, this is, uh, again, very, very useful information. And, uh, uh, you know, heck, uh, we'll, you know, have the line open for emails to come in to, to have more questions. And I'll follow, funnel them back to you. And and uh, who knows, we may have enough information to, to get back together. But uh, I appreciate all the help, Paul. Well, thanks for having me on again, James. Thanks again to Paul. And uh, thanks to everybody who wrote in with questions. And I got another question this morning that we haven't covered, so there may be yet another follow-up in the new year. Don't forget, uh, don't forget to send us your brewing disaster stories by Monday. Steve and I are planning to have a, a little bit of extra fun with this year's show, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, if you have, you can send them to if you get the same place that you. Send stuff if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy. Uh, send those to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our Basic Brewing growler bags are available in our shop. Protect your precious home brew and craft beers. You take it from place to place. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to the podcast. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping to All-Grain Low-Tech, Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. We've got combo deals to save you a few bucks, and they're discounted for the uh, holiday season, by the way. Uh, you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. And don't forget our logbooks. Keep track of up to 50 batches of beer in those. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are CH Hansen 03040 Magnetic Stud Finder. And as I tell my wife, I try to use our stud finder and it just keeps pointing at me. And boy, does she laugh. Weber, se <laughs> Weber 
Weber, a Smoky Mountain Cooker, 22 and a half inch charcoal smoker, black. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site. The next time you feel like Amazon shopping, we greatly appreciate your support. Don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com as well. That's all. Until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>